All right, thanks for taking some time out to talk about Bamboo Station. I would love to know when you first came across their music. So, um, I'd been, uh, you know, big into to reggae music since childhood, since I was 16 years old. And um, I was big on uh, a lot of the early Jamaican reggae music. And um, so I'm just giving you a little context. Um, and so, you know, the big acts that you know about, the Bob Marley's, the Burning Spears, those types of people. Um, and then in 1995, I happened to be uh, in Washington, D.C., and there was this whole uh, live performance thing happening in Washington, D.C., and I'd seen some Virgin Island artists and these uh, artists, uh, and it was midnight, and it exposed me to reggae music from the Virgin Islands and started doing some deep dives in Virgin Islands reggae music, and then uh, I came upon a Bamboo Station um, some years after that. And what I noticed about Virgin Islands reggae music was that while the music from Jamaica was very uh, melodic, right? You have these horn lines, you know, you have um, a lot of these uh, background vocals and harmonies and all that. And it has these, the, the music itself was very melodic. I noticed that with the Virgin Islands reggae music, it was more hypnotic. Right. So they tended to slow down the rhythm more and they were more lyrically oriented. And I really, really loved that style and that music spoke to me. And so when I heard Bamboo Station and I heard the music and their approach to the music, I said, ah, this is exactly my type of style of music. It's not rushed. It's not hurried. And it has a very deep penetrating message. So I, I heard about um, Bamboo Station through friends, through friends of mine from the Virgin Islands. And when I listened to them, I was completely drawn in by their musical offerings. And I just thought that, um, you know, those of us who are uh, connoisseurs of reggae music, we know that there is a rabbit hole that never ends, right? Yeah. And so Bamboo Station was added into that pantheon of music and it just became uh, this never ending exploration into sound, hypnotic vibes and messages that speak very deeply to the soul. I've watched some of your Rumble videos and, and the different places that you post and you obviously have a wealth of knowledge. Who else is in your pantheon just out of curiosity? Wow, that's um, that's pretty big. So um, I'm the type of guy who I listen to music not really based on like who's popular. I listen to what speaks to me. So we can talk about you know modern day um, some of the younger artists, and we can talk about some of the foundation artists. I'm the type of person, you know, I'll listen to Barry Brown, you know, uh, a Jamaican reggae artist, you know, with things in time, you know, I'll be listening to that type of music. I'll be listening to Bamboo Station. I'll be listening to Burning Spear. I'll be listening to Culture. But also I'm a reggae selector. So because I'm a reggae selector, what I do is I have a different approach to music. My approach to music when I play people's when I play for people is I like to play music that is not common. In other words, if I play a Dennis Brown song, I'm not playing Revolution, right? If I play Bob Marley music, I'm not playing One Love. I'm not playing Buffalo Soldier because that's what everyone hears. I'd like for people to receive a musical education when I play music. And to me, the most heartwarming thing is when someone comes to me and says, who was that? What's the name of that song? And you're adding to their joy and you're adding to their vocabulary of music. And so my approach to music has been finding music that not a lot of people know about, but sharing it with the world. You know, the Ijaman Levy's, the Prince Lincoln's. Um, I love out of the VI reggae music, 
that we hear. I love the Remus, the Desiree, the um, Ross Attitude, Batch, Bamboo Station, these types of artists who stay with the roots, you know, in terms of African reggae, of course, you're going to talk about Alpha Blondie, you're going to talk about Lucky Dube, you're going to talk about those types of people. But um, my playlist is very eclectic in terms of artists, many artists who never got their due, people never heard of them before, but I'll be having their songs on, you know, repeat all day long because I just believe that not every artist got a chance to get their music exposed to the world. And, um, you know, as you probably know, it's a never ending gift in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, of, of reggae music. And I think, I, th I don't think that people really grasp how deep it gets and how many artists there are and how many songs there are and, and the beauty that resides within reggae music. It's just, it's a never ending, uh, journey of happiness and inspiration. Mm, absolutely. So my Bob record is Talking Blues. Come There's on, something... man. Come on, man. <laughs> now we're now we going to have to be good friends. Listen, <laughs> listen. Okay, this is crazy. That is... All right. So here's the, here's the question, Derek, that's always asked of us, right? What's, those of us who are into like reggae music, they'll say... Bob Marley, what's your favorite Bob Marley song, right? People ask that, right? Anytime when you're having a session with people, everyone's smoking up and everyone's chilling, what's your favorite Bob? And it's almost a trick question because Bob Marley never wrote a bad song, <laughs> right? And it, which is crazy. And it's something that doesn't get talked about enough. You know, they talk about other aspects of Bob Marley, but there needs to be a deep interrogation of how one man can write 300 songs and not one of them was bad, <laughs> like objectively speaking. Right. So someone asked me that question a long time ago. What's your favorite Bob Marley song? And, you know, my original answer is like, that's like asking what's your favorite kid. Right. Because um, they, <laughs> they all have their different things that speak to you. But the way I did it was I, I didn't qualify it. I quantified that question. Other words, what I, the other way to ask it is what is the Bob Marley song that I play the most? Right. And that was easy. And my answer is Talking Blues. Hmm. Talking Blues yeah. is the song of Bob Marley that I play the most. Probably second would be Stiff Naked Fools. But um, for you to just say Talking Blues out of the blue right now is, <laughs> is, is, is amazing. Because that's, and I've, I've always said to myself, and I've told family members, like, at my funeral, that's the song that I would want played, hmm. Talking Blues. <laughs> I've been fortunate to visit the reggae archives. I've known Roger Steffens for a long time and he gave me the mother B tapes a long time ago. And there's a moment where Bob is in his mother's bedroom playing what would become work, the song work. Mm. And he's just noodling through it. And you just hear him for that whole tape, just kind of figuring things out. And I, because I agree with you, you know, there's legend Bob, which everyone knows, but then to hear him in his element figuring things out is just another level of beautiful that really from from that music genre and selection just is very meaningful to me. Absolutely. And a lot of people talked about the Bob Marley film, which I saw recently. And for me, you know, you you read people's reviews, you hear people talk about it. It's very funny because people don't see what you might see. Right. So the most important part of that film to me is when they were working out the song Exodus, hmm. right? Yeah. The process. Yes. The, the genius involved, you know, in, in bringing it back to Bamboo Station. Um, I, I was a fan of Bamboo Station before I met their lead singer, Jelani. Mm -hmm. Me and Jelani became friends and I got a chance to interrogate him on his process come to find out, you know, he's, he's writing the songs, he's playing the keyboards, he's doing the chord structure on the guitar and all that. And you ask these guys, how did you learn how to play music? And they'll say, I just picked up the guitar. So you didn't get any lessons? Or, no, he learned how he taught himself how to play bass. So these guys are, these guys are autodidactic, right? They're self, they're self taught. And there's a lot to be said for that. One of the things that's also interesting about a lot of these guys, a lot of them are not students of reggae music in the sense of I would play 
like old Dennis Brown, some old Bob Marley, songs they never even heard. And I'm saying, how are you able to create this profound reggae music? But you yourself have not listened to a lot of it. You haven't, and it's just something that is deep within these guys, you know, and, and I'm talking about like in Jamaica, I have uh, friends who are reggae artists and the Virgin Islands, I have friends who are reggae artists. And it's, it's just been fascinating to, to, to see their musical genius and knowing that most of them have no real formal musical training. They just have an ear, they have a heart, they have a mind. And it all comes together in this beautiful expression through reggae music, you know? When I was talking to Jelani, that's what he told me, uh, that he was self-taught. And to think of how good of an album One Day is for musicians to come together the way they did is, is kind of mind-blowing to me. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. And, you know, um, I'm one of these people that, uh, for me, number one, uh, I, I believe what Wynton Marcellus says, that... Um, Great art doesn't come to you. You have to come to it, right? So it's up to you to find great art. And when you find great art, understand that great art is what all human beings deserve. Because Lorraine Hansberry also says that the classical people deserve a classical art. And when you listen to Bamboo Station's music, um, like you said, these are guys who are not formally trained in music and they pick it up and the music sounds just as good or better than anyone who's classically trained in any musical form. And listening to, let's say, the One Day album, which we were talking about, which is being re-released, it has the quality of what I call eternally fresh, right? You can mm -hmm. just like Bob Marley's music or Peter Tosh music or Burn Fear music, you don't know if it was made yesterday, 10 years ago, or 20 years ago. It's eternally fresh. It's not music that is based, even the lyrical content is not something that's based on the hype of the day or the uh, particular what's hip for the day. It can be played 20 years from now. It can be played 10 years ago. And it sounds as if it's brand new. It's eternally fresh. And so that is actually a requirement for me in terms of the music that I play. Because what happens is, is that when people ask me about the music and they ask me where, you know, who is it and what have you, they're usually asking me because the music is new to them. And they're thinking that this music was made very recently. I'm saying this was made in 1975 or this Bamboo <laughs> Station album was made in, you know, 2000, 20 years ago and, you know, or 2004, 2005. And for the new listener, they have no idea the time period that it was made. And to me, that is the mark of great music, that it's eternally fresh and it stands, you know, some people call it stands the test of time. And so um, I'm always in amazement when I meet people who are able to do it. Mm -hmm. And as, as you say, you talk to Jelani, I don't think that a lot of times these artists understand the historical impact of their work. They're just being themselves and they're just doing it. And they may have not known that it's still going to resonate 50 years later in a real way. Yes. You know, and I think that that is the true mark of success when it comes to being an artist, you know? Yes, absolutely. So you're playing a set. What Bamboo Station song do you go to? All right. So <laughs> there's a few Bamboo Station songs that I go to. Um, and they're from different albums. Um, I can talk about the One Day album. I can talk about um, the albums uh, subsequent to that. Um, we'll start with One Day and then go from there. Okay. So One Day, my selections for One Day, um, and they're for different reasons. Uh, we're going to go with Pass It. Pass It. Pass It. I love that tune. I've played it many times. Um, my Actions, I play that one. It's a hypnotic song. 
It has a it has a hypnotic feel to it. Me not mess with you. Me not mess with you. I play that one a lot. And the one that tends to catch people outside of a dance where I play it for people. So for instance, one of the stories I can tell you is my wife, when I first met her, she's from a Caribbean island called Dominica. Uh, her father was a Rasta man. So she grew up listening to reggae music on a very serious level. She was exposed to mainly Jamaican reggae music. She didn't know much about Virgin Islands artists. So as we're driving, we were driving to the Florida Keys and I started playing Virgin Islands reggae music. And I played the eyes of men. Now she didn't have the ear for it. She didn't know how to listen to it because she was used to the reggae music of her father, you know, the studio one reggae music with high melodies and background vocals of harmonies and, you know, three part harmonies and all that. And so it was new to her, but when I played eyes of men, we ended up playing that song on the trip for an hour on repeat. <laughs> and she's shedding tears as I'm telling her, you know, what's being said. Now she gets an ear for it and she's understanding this the song is about it's a song about women. It's a tribute to women and how Jelani is singing that song. And I'll never forget that. And the really interesting part about that is is that after that, we moved to the Virgin Islands. Um, when we moved to the Virgin Islands, Jelani was there because I, I went to the Virgin Islands and I actually stayed in Jelani's studio when I first moved to the Virgin Islands. I moved there before my wife. When she came, I said, you, you remember the song Eyes of Men? She said, of course. You know, we played all the time. I said, um, that's, that's him right there, Jelani. She couldn't believe it. She could not believe that she was meeting the person who wrote this song that so emotionally moved her, you know? So that song for me is special because of the story behind it in terms of how my wife reacted to it. That's not necessarily a song that I play um, during the dances. It's more of a song that's contemplative, something you sit down, you listen to, and you really observe yourself, think about the women in your life, listen to how Jelani's singing the song, the songwriting behind it. Is, um, is absolutely incredible. I think it's one of the, the great songs that was written um, in terms of a tribute to women. You know, he talks about Betty Shabazz at the end of it. Um, when I was a university student, I invited, Be I was a head of uh, one of the student organizations and I invited Betty Shabazz to come speak. So I actually met Betty Shabazz before she passed away and spent a whole day with her. And so, you know, fast forward 20 years later, when, you know, I'm a grown man, uh, from my college days, there's a song that gives tribute to Betty Shabazz. And I remember this woman who's sitting on a couch next to me. And I'm asking her all types of questions about her deceased husband and questions about her life. And she actually resembled my grandmother to a degree, Betty Shabazz. So when I hear Eyes of Men, it also has uh, a serious meaning to me as well. And I, I advise Everybody, if you don't listen to anything, listen to Eyes of Men, sit down, relax, and hear the beauty of that song, the sincerity of that song, and what it, what it, what it does to you. Now, the song that I play that gets people really, really excited from the One Day album, um, and that has a backstory behind it too, is Man in Exile. So... Man in Exile now is, you know, a song that tells a real story, man. It's talking about these leaders who are corrupt, who've stolen from the national coffers, and then they end up going in exile, like a man like Mengistu. And, and in Bamboo Station, he names a few of these guys in that song, like Mengistu. And now what's really interesting about Mengistu is, is that um, when he took over from Haile Selassie with um, his regime, it was called the Dirge. I actually, the backstory of that is, is that I went to school in Boston. I don't know if you know anything about Boston, Derek. 
-hmm. But in Boston, there's a huge Ethiopian immigrant community. And I lived with Ethiopians and Eritreans most of my college and law school career. I lived with them. And they told me stories of going to school and their friends disappearing during the Mengistu regime. A lot of those guys, when they came to United States in Boston, one of the first uh, employment uh, avenues that they had was to work as parking lot attendants. And there's even a funny story behind that, and I'm, I'm not going to get into that, but you know, maybe you know, w w I'll, I'll share it with you another time. But a lot of them work for parking lots for what, one reason or another, probably the first wave of men who came, that's the job that they got. So when the other ones came, they were able to get jobs working at parking lots. Well, I remember a story, Derek, of an Ethiopian family going to a baseball game at Fenway Park. And of course, you have to go to these, you know, paid parking lots. The guy's going with his family, you know, they've been in America, they're trying to Im integrate into the American way. And so, you know, they find out that baseball is America's favorite pastime. So, you know, they get their Boston Red Sox hats and everything and, you know, trying to be Americans, you know. <laughs> um, and I think at the time, the husband or the father had just become an American citizen. And so to celebrate, they wanted to go to a Boston Red Sox baseball game because, you know, that's as American as apple pie. It's the American favorite pie on baseball. Not that they even knew anything about baseball. They just wanted to be <laughs> Americans, right? Yeah. He pulls up to the parking lot, and the parking lot attendant is an Ethiopian. But he looks at him carefully, and it's the guy 15 years prior who tortured him <laughs> under the Mengistu regime. Wow. And all hell breaks loose, <laughs> right? All hell breaks loose because what's happening is, is that that guy who was working in the parking lot left through the overthrow of um, Mengistu, and now he's in exile. And he comes, and he's working at Fenway Park. And the guy that he tortured pulls up with his family and meets him eye to eye. So when I hear that song, Derek, Man in Exile, <laughs> that story comes up over and over. So a lot of these songs have a lot of backstories in my own personal life. And so they're more than just music for me, you know? Yeah. So that, that particular song is, a, is something that people don't talk about a lot. People don't talk about all of these guys who ruin their countries and then go live lives in retirement in exile. And... It's absolutely brilliant for him to take that and turn that into a song, you know, so hats off to Jelani for that. Yeah, it's very, I mean, he's a very thoughtful man, at least from the little that I've interacted with him. And the lyrics, every story, because that's partly what I'm doing here is I'm talking to him and then writing these posts about the meanings of the stories. And everyone is so rich. Everyone has a novel behind it, really. And so... You know, we've talked a little about genres and different eras of reggae and you you pull from everything. But I'm wondering, either with Bamboo Station or just more generally, what are some of the great narratives, the great stories that are told you find with reggae music? So, I mean, you know, um, reggae music is coming from an anti-colonial movement, you know. Um, and so, you know, you, you have the Rastafari influence, which is an anti-colonial, you know, it's a it's part theology, it's part culture, but it's really sprung by um, politics and the politics of the time of, you know, you've got the Caribbean world, you've got the African world going through independence and trying to take the vestiges of colonialism off and everything that that means where people are developing their own identity, developing their own worldview trying to tap back into their roots. And so you have this um, philosophy of back to Africa that's coming with Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey, um, 
gets considered a prophet within the Rastafari movement. You have these displaced Africans starting to look towards Africa when the educational system teaches them nothing about Africa. At the same time, they're outcasts in a society that is a society that's pushing colonial education. So you have a convergence of like a perfect storm to create this beautiful music. So what you find in the music generally is you'll find the double meaning of what it means to play roots music, right? Roots in, in, in terms of the art form, but the roots in terms of your heritage. Who are you really? Because you've got to remember, these are people who don't have access to know even which ethnic group they come from in Africa. And they're trying to find how they connect. And they're told that you've got to worship Queen Elizabeth as your head of state. And they found another monarch that speaks more to them and their heritage, which is highly Selassie. So it creates all types of things around um, a resistance to a manufactured patriotism, to a monarch who is not yours, does not look like you, does not share values with you, does not really care about you, is a removed monarch and is basically an absentee landlord. And you now have someone who has a long lineage and culture that you try to justify through the same book that they gave you to introduce you to God, which is the Bible which is a collection of Hebrew stories, but then this man also is claiming that he has lineage to you know, Hebrew kings, uh, like King David and what have you, and you have the Kebra and the Gast, and you have the history of Judaism in Ethiopia, the history of Christianity in uh, Ethiopia to the, you know, the churches in Aksum and Lalibela and all of that. And so now you have these people who don't know which part of Africa they come from, but there is one king who seems to be getting a lot of notoriety. He's in Time Magazine as the man of the year. He has a coronation and all these other people go to him. And so it starts making people who've never been taught to feel good about themselves to start to feel good about themselves. There's a music that springs from it that comes from the jazz era and using the horns as a repeater, as a rhythm, as opposed to using the horned as a lead, the horns are now doubled and tripled and used as a repeater and you start getting reggae music, you get ska, you get rock steady, you get reggae music from it. But it is not music that is just purely talking about human love relationships as most of these um, popular music talks about. It talks about the relationships uh, between men and women, the pain that have to do with heartbreak and love and all of that. But they want to talk about what they're experiencing in terms of their love for Africa, their love for a new culture that they're developing, their own theology, a sense of independence, a sense of freedom. And then it becomes something that circles around a common human story of, of searching, who are you? What are you here for? And what is your contribution supposed to be? Those are some of the interrogations of reggae music. So you start having conversations about justice. And then within it, you also have this beautiful genre of lover's rock, where you have the Gregory, the Gregory Isaacs who are singing love songs and relationship songs and some of the most beautiful songs. But what I find to me to be one of the more appealing parts of reggae music is, is that it is a music that can be played multi-generationally, right? And th there's a lot to be said for that because popular music is usually music that within whatever time period, it stratifies the generations. And what I mean by that is, is that the generations are completely bifurcated in the enjoyment of the popular music of the day, where the popular music of the day in America is for young people, right? Whatever it may be at that time, rock and roll in the 50s was for young people. You know, hip hop is for young people. The jazz was like for young people when jazz was more mainstream and underground. That was what the young people were doing. And then the old people are looking down at it and feeling like, you know, this is not for us. And these young people are crazy and even inappropriate in a lot of ways. Right. The language and, you know, because, it, you know, young people like to push the edge. You're, you're not going to be a young person unless you're pushing the edge. You know, if you're young and you're not pushing the edge, then you're, you're wasting your youth. Right. So because that's what creates new things. But what I find with reggae music outside of the political aspect of Rastas being hated in Jamaica, reggae music is something I can play 
with my grandmothers, my grandfathers, and with young children, because it's not a vulgar music. It's not a music of vulgarity. It's not a music of over-sexualization. It's not a music that is inappropriate in any way, unless you know you start talking about the ganja aspect of the music, and people might be offended by that. But as time has gotten, more and more people are used, to, you know, the legalization of ganja and all of that. So now, this is a music that you can play for all age groups. And now, for the first time, you've got grandma, daddy, and mommy, kid, and grandkid all in the same room listening to the same music and being able to enjoy it. So I think that that's one of the qualities of reggae music that I love in terms of what I've been able to observe. It's pretty amazing. I've spent a good amount of time in Morocco covering music festivals. And really? one yeah, Morocco. one thing I noticed mm-hmm, one thing I noticed is that when I'd go to a festival, whether it was Western artists coming over, Asian artists coming over, but the, also the, all the festivals always focus on North African and West African artists as well. And you'll see four generations of people together singing the lyrics of, of Ganawa music or, or, or the Eritrean music, as you said earlier. And it, um, it's, it's nice. It's, it's something I, I think some American folk traditions have that, but it doesn't seem to be the same, the same magnetism, uh, and, and dynamic, and it doesn't speak to the same issues, I don't think. So I, I've always appreciated that with reggae as well. Yeah. And I, I would also say, I'll tell you a story. This isn't, I, this is specific to Bob Marley, but I think it's also general to the genre. So I think that reggae music also has a superpower of changing the neurotransmitters in the human brain. And here's what I mean by that. There was a time when Lauryn Hill was like the biggest artist in the world. I think you might remember that period. I, I do. It had to be around... <laughs> That had to be around 99, 2000, around that time. And she, of course, was married to Rohan Marley, so she became part of the Marley family. And um, they had a big concert in Miami, because I was living in Miami at the time, at the Bayfront Amphitheater. You may be familiar with this. It's a big amphitheater. They hold a lot of um, shows there, and they do some of the big reggae shows there. And um, because, you know, Lauryn Hill is with the Fugees and so there's a hip hop element. And so there was rap music there. The DJs were playing. And this is a big amphitheater, man. I'm talking like 20,000 people can fit in there. And Lauryn Hill was to perform and a couple of reggae artists were to perform, a couple of hip hop artists and, and what have you. So, you know, during intermission, the DJs play. So the selectors are playing music. And of course, you know, it's the young guys playing. So they're playing hip hop music, you know? And I don't even remember, but it's a long, maybe an hour break, man. You know how these festivals, these things go, you know? And they're, they're playing hip hop music. And I'll never forget this, Derek. A fight breaks out. And for those people who've been in large audiences, when a fight breaks out, it can be very dangerous because people can get trampled, especially when there's a huge audience. Um, There's a density of people. And so just as a, you know, as a tip to some of the listeners who may be listening, whenever you are at a live concert venue outdoors, try to place yourself next to a tree. So that if there ever is a trampling thing going on, you can just be by the tree because people can't run into the tree. (laughs) So you stand by the tree and you're protected, right? This is something that I learned some time ago. So I'm standing by a tree. So I'm good. And (laughs) I'm seeing this fight break out and people start to trample each other. And it could have been a huge disaster. Huge especially if they had to close down the venue and then everyone came to see Lauren Hill. People have been disappointed. Anger would have even increased, right? 
because this those types of things it's it's infectious right um when the fight started to break out the whole place is starting to see the fight people are starting to run the djs derek you can hear them on the mic saying oh stop fighting stop fighting you all stop fighting with you know we came here for a good time stop they're trying to intervene and say nobody's listening people are scared and one of the guys in the DJ crew says put on some bob marley put on some bob marley there they played natural mystic <laughs> dun 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 there's a natural listen when they put the music on the fight stopped immediately and everybody started dancing and were in their right mind. I saw this happen right in front of my eyes. <laughs> and it let me know the power of reggae music in terms of how it affects the neurotransmitters in human beings. People's fear went away, people's anger went away, the anxiety went away, the hopelessness went away. Everyone was happy. Everyone was in a vibes. And I saw this happen and I'm saying to myself, that DJ crew or at least one of them knew what reggae music does why were they playing other music <laughs> if they knew what it would do in the first place they knew that reggae music is going to make people have a good time and be feeling love and peace and hopefulness and vibe so why are you actually even playing any other music as far as i'm concerned if you have an outdoor crowd why are you playing music that's going to make people violent and aggressive and you know in your heart that once you put this music on is the antidote to foolishness <laughs> seems to me that you'd be paying playing that the whole time through so you know that's my story for understanding the power of reggae music you know i mean i have many <laughs> stories but yeah man <laughs> that's a great story let's let's land this plane back with bamboo station yeah. since that's where we started. Uh, yeah. So you heard their music. It hit you on that level. Oh, yeah, yeah. And then you got to meet the artists. Like, yeah. how did how did that go? I'm sure you've met a lot of artists, obviously, being in your career. But did the, did the people of Bamboo Station match up to what you were hearing on the record? Yeah, um, that and more. So, you know, of course, it's not just Jelani. Um, you have... Um, you know, one of the musicians, and I believe he does a lot of the production work, is a, is a guy named Andy. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's Andy Lanos. I think that's mm -hmm. his name. And I've met him once or twice, and just the nicest guy in the world. Quiet, nice. And so a lot of them knew me as an artist because I used to be a professional poet. So I was in this artistic world. And... Um, also, one of the background vocalists, Kojo Johnson, I know him also, and he's an outstanding person. Um, you know, he's into capoeira. He's a capoeira master. And um, he does a great job on a song called Walk Your Mile. Um, he sings the vocals on that um, and also the harmony on that. And it's just absolutely beautiful. Um, Matt Swamp Guinea, he's a drummer and he's a musicologist excellent human being. Um, Tough Lion, I've met Tough Lion, who's played with Bamboo Station, and just an encyclopedia yeah. uh, for music, and just gentle spirits. Um, also the keyboard player, um, his name is Kat. Uh, he does a lot of work with Rima. He's Rima's producer. And um, so I've seen them together and play, and it just, it was a great brotherhood. I remember um, when Bamboo Station was playing in the Virgin Islands and I met those guys on the beach in St. John. We were all just chilling on the beach, man. It's just, just like a great brotherhood, man, of respect. But Jelani is the one that I know the most. And I, would, and I certainly consider Jelani one of the kindest, empathetic human beings that I've met. And I don't just say it because I like his music. This is outside of the music. And, you know, what's really interesting, Derek, is, is that most of my conversations with Jelani have nothing to do with Bamboo Station or music. You know, 
And a lot of people don't even realize how funny Jelani is. Like his personality, the stories that he tells, because a lot of people think he's very serious because of the music that he he sings, but it's a very well-rounded individual. And if you ever get him to tell you stories, and I think he's very interesting, actually. I find him to be very interesting because he was born, I believe, in the Virgin Islands, but spent a, spent a lot of time in the States mm-hmm. um, and went to school in the States. But he has one of the thickest Virgin Islands accents that I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And um, so he never lost that. And um, he was actually my host. Like I said, like he was really my introduction to to St. Thomas Virgin Islands. And he did a lot for me when I first came. He showed me around. He drove me around. Um, he helped me, you know, locate my first apartment. So we're like, we're, we're real friends, you know? And we can talk about music. And we have robust arguments about reggae music. You know, we have robust arguments about who's this and who's that, who's a great songwriter, who's, and we get to share music and we share opinions and, 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 and what have you, you know? So um, I would just say that it's been an honor to know someone like Jelani. It's an honor to know that, you know, a lot of times you meet artists and they don't live up to the things that they talk about in terms of just the energy and the vibes, right? Most artists are very egotistical. It almost comes part and parcel of being an artist. Um, a lot of them don't handle fame, adulation, attention very well. Um, Jelani's very humble. and You wouldn't even know that he is who he is. You wouldn't even know that he's come up with some of the greatest songs in the reggae music genre that are going to stand the test of time. And it's funny sometimes because, you know, I'm, I'm, I was born in Ghana and in Ghana, um, you know, they love reggae music in Ghana, man. And uh, I've met selectors in Ghana, like DJs in Ghana. And they'll talk about Virgin Islands reggae music. And I'll ask them, do you know Bamboo Station? They'll be like, yeah, we know Bamboo Station. We play Bamboo Station music all the time. And I remember a conversation I had with one guy. His name was Black Santino. He's a big um, reggae radio personality in Ghana and West Africa. And I remember saying to him, yeah, I know the lead singer. He's like a good friend of mine. And Black Santino did not believe me. (laughs) He said, you know... You know Bamboo Station personally? I was like, yeah. He was like, nah, you don't know. I was like, yeah, I know. I had to call Jelani and be like, hey, Jelani, we're friends, right? (laughs) (laughs) To put him on the phone because in certain parts of the world, Bamboo Station is no joke. People play that music as a soundtrack to their lives. And I had to tell Jelani the story because a lot of times a lot of artists don't realize, especially if you're not on a billboard, you're not on, you know, these big... Um, platforms and uh, doing, you know, tours and winning Grammys and what have you. Sometimes you don't know how and where your music penetrates, man. And so just to go to a place where you haven't done a lot of marketing, you've never performed and you're just like all the rage there. it's, 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 It's something to behold, man, you know, and it's also, I think, also a good payment for the humility and the output that you've made without necessarily the monetary recompense, right? Just to know that someone's heard you sometimes is enough, man, and that you've made a profound influence or one of your songs moved someone to think a different way or to reflect and have just a good day is the payment that I think cannot be measured in fiat currency. You know, maybe in Bitcoin, but not fiat currency. While the youths them in the streets are playing, someone life gets destructive. 